Seconds away on Studio 5. You told me to come out here. Mac, this is happening inside you. Taking you behind the scenes of the new film, The Shack. Production for the film unfolded over the course of two months here in Vancouver. Don't ever think that what my son chose to do didn't cost us both dearly. We're on set with the cast. I wanted to be a part of this film because it means so much to me personally. And taking a closer look at the best-selling book. We're talking about more than 19 million people buying and reading this book. Uh, any nerves going into, like, people yes. love this. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm nervous doing this in interview right oh, now. No, no. <laughs> Plus, an exclusive sample of the soundtrack. If you can know the stars and plays, you can know my heart. All in Studio 5, starting now. And welcome to Studio 5. This week we are at a lone shack in the woods to bring you a behind the scenes look at the film, The Shack. We'll get to that in just a bit, but first, like we do every week, let's count down the top five trending stories in uplifting entertainment. Let's begin with the first two. At number five. We've never, never done anything this big before. We re reached out to the people at Walmart and uh, they want to give each one of you a four year scholarship. Cheers to Ellen giving full scholarships to an entire senior class at a charter school in a struggling Brooklyn neighborhood. To help the students of Summit Academy to continue their education, Walmart is donating a four-year college scholarship to any state university of New York, and everyone uh, in your senior class is getting that. It's a gift worth $1.6 million. At number four. Hello, 911. I need to report a missing person. My baby's 30 minutes now. Actor Stephen Baldwin battles sex trafficking in a new faith-based dramatic thriller. Please let me go. I promise I won't say anything. Where a journalist who covers the crime goes missing on her wedding night. Run premieres March 9th. God, please help us. You said that if we walk through the water, we will not be drowned. And that's a look at number five and number four. The countdown continues in just a bit. William Paul Young wrote The Shack in 2007, published it on his own. It has now grown to sell more than 20 million copies, and now it is a major motion picture. Here's your first look. We are the only television news crew allowed on set for this behind the scenes look at The Shack. You told me to come out here. Mac, this is happening inside you. Based on the best-selling book, it tells the story of a father whose faith is shaken after tragedy, wondering how a good God would allow such a nightmare to happen. There is a beautiful journey that you have to take that I realize now um, when you take on a role, well, the role of God, and uh, it just shows you just how human you are. Oscar winner Octavia Spencer plays the role of God, affectionately called Papa. You know everything. You're everywhere all at once. You have limitless power. Yet somehow, you let my little girl die. When she needed you most. You abandoned her. Sam Worthington is Mac. I never left her. If you are who you say you are, where were you when I needed you? On the surface, Mac, initially in the film, seems to have it all together despite the things he, he, he's gone through. And then we learn, I mean, as the layers get, get peeled back. I like kind of taking on characters where they, you know, they have these challenges within themselves and then the challenges kind of ripple out. Like, I've done a lot of movies that are quest movies. Um, and this, in a way, is like that. It's a quest to discover what your faith is and, and, you know, is what you believe in your heart still gonna help you through the hard times? As the title suggests, the setting for Paul Young's book is A Lone Shack in the Woods. It's a story of love and loss. He initially wrote 
as a Christmas gift to his children. It came from 50 years of trying to find good responses to difficult questions. It took me 50 years to actually become a child. And then, and then I was able to take 50 years of history and give a gift for Christmas to my kids. Wow. What were your kids' response initially? Thanks, thanks Dad, a book. Uh, <laughs> we'll get right on that. <laughs> but when they read it, they were touched, every one of them differently, and that, that happens all the time. So this book goes from self-published to selling 22 million copies, and oh, now kind a, of a, major, surprise. a major motion picture. When you sat down to write this story, did you envision all of this? Oh, no. Are you kidding? Um, I made 15 copies at Office Depot that did everything I ever wanted that book to do. So, mm. <laughs> so this has all been a, a monumental surprise. I think the, uh, the grace and the kindness and the sense of humor of God, yes. With success also comes critics, and I know that you've uh, heard my people, <laughs> yeah, people being critical of the fact that you, of how you chose to portray God. You misunderstand the mystery. Though a work of fiction, some have called Young's depiction of God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit profoundly unbiblical. One seminary professor wrote his own book in response called Burning Down the Shack. What do you say to them? We need to be challenged about how we think. And a lot of times, people's responses are based in they're afraid. And I know that because I lived in that world. So when a person's upset, they're not coming to tell me about me. I already know about me. They're coming to tell me in the only language they know how about what matters to them. And if I'm not at risk, I can step inside that space. Maybe ask a good question, maybe stay silent, but respectful, because it is about the dignity of the other and the journey that the other is in. And in Mac's fictional journey, he sees Jesus as a Middle Eastern man, the Holy Spirit as an Asian woman, and God as a black woman. Don't ever think that what my son chose to do didn't cost us both dearly. How does Papa, you portraying that role, compare to how you may have pictured God growing up? Uh, very differently. Um, it actually, uh, you know, broke a few conventions for me and a, a um, I like the idea of, of uh, uh, a regular person's conversation with God. Basically, the breakthrough for me was realizing that the father is the father. So I, I approached it as a parent to a son. I think God is essentially love. You know, he's coming at you in a form of love. So whatever helps embrace and, and gives you that love, I think is, is, a, is a great idea. He is who we need at that time. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> And you can find The Shack in theaters beginning March 3rd. Still ahead on Studio 5. Absolutely. God is to blame. Getting a bit more personal with the man bringing a heartbroken father from the pages to the screen. Did you see any of Sam Worthington in Mac? Look, I've been, you know, I've, I've built my shack. <laughs> uh, say, like, if the shack is a metaphor for all the anger and the guilt and the resentment. And welcome back to Studio 5. We are continuing our countdown of this week's top five trending stories in uplifting entertainment news. Here are the next two. At number three, Viola Davis's historic Oscar win. And the Oscar goes to Viola Davis. I became an artist and thank God I did because we are the only profession that celebrates what it means to live a life. The first black actress to win an Oscar, an Emmy, and a Tony. And I can't believe my life, you know? I mean, my sister is here somewhere, and I grew up in poverty. You know, I grew up in apartments that were condemned and rat-infested. Um, and I just always sort of wanted to be somebody. And um, I just wanted to be good at something. And um, so this is sort of like the miracle of, of God. Number two, former New York Nick and NBA All-Star Amari Stoudemire is still in the game, playing in Israel with Hapoel Jerusalem a team where he's part owner. I wanted to play basketball here in Jerusalem. Uh, I always wanted to play here. 
He was honored Sunday with a Martin Luther King Jr. Award for his work off the court with at-risk children. And there is only one more left in the countdown. We're going to get to that in just a bit. Actor Sam Worthington has the starring role in the film The Shack, and he's actually got a bit of a Shack story of his own, and he's sharing it exclusively with Studio 5 in this week's interview. If you are who you say you are, where were you when I needed you? When all you see is your pain, you lose sight of me. The conversations that this man gets to share with God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, there was something in them that I had those conversations um, at some point in my life and, and, and still now. Don't ever think that what my son chose to do didn't cost us both dear. Love always leaves a mark. Did you see any of Sam Worthington in Mac? Um, yeah, when I was, look, I've been, you know, I've, I've built my shack. <laughs> uh, Say, so, like, if the shack is a metaphor for all the, the anger and the guilt and the resentment and the, the frustrations we have with life and then we live in it, I've definitely lived in mine sometime in my life. Um, and I've also struggled with, you know, the questions that Mac has towards his faith and towards God of why is this happening to me and why does bad stuff happen to others, all these kind of massive questions that to some of us remain un, you know, unanswered and challenging. And uh, so that kind of, there's aspects of what I was searching for within those, that framework, yeah. How have you settled those questions for yourself or have you? Um, well, as Mac says, you know, he's just beginning his journey and I, I think I'm on a journey. You know, I, uh, I came to my faith very late. I was in about my 20s when I kind of, you know, was given a Bible to read by my friend to tell me to calm down. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was dating a lot of girls that were religious, so I would go with them to, to churches. It was never something that was put upon me as a kid. It was something that I've kind of been journeying on through by choice of discovering how faith can help people and help you become a better person. So, you know, I, I think that but doing something like this, it was just part of that journey. Some personal questions about your journey. I read, and you can tell me if this is incorrect, that your dad, when you dropped out of college, gives you $400 in a one-way ticket and says, work your way back home. Yeah, what correct. was the story about that? Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, and my dad didn't want me sitting around on the couch watching TV and wasting this precious gift. So he said, you know, he's always had a strong work ethic and he's instilled that in me. And so he said, well, I'll send you as far away on the other side of Australia to where we live and work your way back and go grow up a bit. What was that journey like? Well, you're over old, I was 18, 19. It's difficult, it's reckless. Um, but you're, you, you learn way more than I would if I sat on the couch um, <laughs> and watched other people's lives. Um, you know, it was, I, you know, it was one of those kind of experiences that I look back on fondly, but also look back on and go, Oh geez, that you know, I won't ever tell anyone that story. <laughs> but you're 19, 20, you're bulletproof, you think you can rule the world. You have two boys now. Would you send either of them on a journey like that? Um, yeah, probably. If, if it's it's weird, I'm a long way off from those kind of big questions with my sons. So mm, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. But I think any kind of journey, be it a physical one, a spiritual one, um, a self-reflecting one. I think is, is always important, you know. I also read that you sold everything at one point and lived in a car. Yeah. And what happened? Before I turned 30, I'd had a solid career in Australia making movies, but I looked around at everything that I owned and felt that it was defining me, and I didn't like who it was defining and what it was saying. So, as I said, I looked in the mirror one day and decided I didn't like what I saw, so I thought I'd sell the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, went and lived in a car for a bit and, uh, and to figure out what I was doing. Did you find God in, in, in that? I think you those find a, a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I, was, I, I came to my faith really late. So I was about turning 30 when I did that. And the questions that you have are 
angry man questions. Why, what's going on with my life? What am I doing? Why am I here? You know, why is this happening to me? And I think that when I reached out to God, I got someone that listened for the first time and wasn't judgmental. And I may not have got the answers back, but I had a comforting ear. So when I reached out, when I'm sitting in the back of a car in the middle of the snow, <laughs> angry at everything, and angry at myself, and angry at railing at everything, what I got back was, it's okay, you know, it's, it's, everything's gonna be okay, and that love kind of helps you through. So has that changed your life, that connection? Yeah, that there's someone always there. Being connected to God can help us connect to each other. By the way, Sam's film credits include Avatar Everest and Hacksaw Ridge. Up next on Studio 5. So here I am, lifting up my heart to the one who holds the stars. Sampling the music behind the movie in a Studio 5 exclusive. And welcome back to Studio 5. It is time for number one in our weekly countdown. Number one is probably no surprise. I'm not who you think I am. Octavia Spencer follows up her Oscar-nominated performance in Hidden Figures with the premiere of The Shack. When it comes to playing God, any intimidation or concern taking on this role? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm used to playing people, uh, not the supreme being. So um, it, actually, I, I, I was really stressed out about it. I was excited because I, I pursued the role. And then when you get it, you realize, oh, now I have to actually do it. Every good movie needs a good soundtrack, and The Shack is no exception. Its soundtrack includes names like Lecrae, Faith Hill, Tim McGraw, and Lady Antebellum. And their music is what's playing in my ear. Why did you bring me? There's no easy answer that'll take your pain away. Where were you when I needed you? I never left you. I never left this. Ain't it just like a tear? We saw an early rough cut of the film. Um, gosh, I can't remember when it was, but it was early in the process. And, and uh, we wrote it with Shane McAnally and Lori McKenna and Faith and I. We watched the movie. And of course, we were six or seven times in the film, we were just flooded with tears for this film. I want him to hurt like he hurt me. We went back in the little room afterwards and sort of put our notes together. We'd all taken notes on the film because we were trying to figure out if we could actually sit down and really write a song for it. You want the promise of a pain-free life. There isn't one. Every one of our notes, the biggest note that we had was keep your eyes on me. And it came back to the simplicity of finding a mantra that can get you through hard times. You can do this. I can't. But on your own, you can't. When Max stepped out of the boat and he said, I can't do this, and Jesus said, just keep your eyes on me, it, all, it struck a chord for us and it made us think that that's what we wanted to write this song about. This is your flying lesson. We wanted to write this song that equaled the arc of the movie, that we had the pain in the beginning of the, of the song and then the redemption and the light and the beauty at the end with, with the, the, the choir and with Faith doing those majestic things that she was doing at the end of it. If you can come to raging sea, you can come to storm in me. You're never too far away. The thought process that everybody was going through about what this film was about and how it made you feel, I think everybody sort of felt that on set. So I think that that transferred itself in the making of the record. I talked to God about you. I ain't even met you yet. Everybody's waiting on you here. I think the, the thing that draws everybody to it is what I'd said earlier, is the universal themes that, that this movie really creates and, and speaks to. And that's the, the search for forgiveness, the search for love, the search for hope, um, and finding your way again. And I think everybody's on that path every single day. And I think musicians are in tune to that in a lot of ways because we're musicians. And, our emotions are always pretty open. And uh, so I think that that really drew a lot of people to it. And, and, and there's a lot of faith involved. And you can sample that soundtrack even before you see the film. It is available right now. Still ahead on Studio 5. We all live with two things. 
love and loss. A final word from the man who gave us the best-selling book that became this major motion picture. All of our divisions go away when we start getting inside eyeball to eyeball and talk about love and loss. We are just about out of time, so let's take a look ahead to next week. Were you always playing on God's team? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I was always uh, on it, but I wasn't. I wasn't playing, definitely wasn't playing the way he called me to play. We're sitting down with actor and former athlete T.C. Stallings. And playing on God's team and letting God lead your life, your bumps and bruises make sense. He breaks down the game plan for success and gives Studio 5 an inside scoop on his upcoming film projects. And that is just one story from next week's rundown. As for this week's show, I'm giving the final word to the author of The Shack, William Paul Young. He has a word about challenging the way you think. We all live with two things, love and loss. All of our divisions go away when we start getting inside eyeball to eyeball and talk about love and loss. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of this comes rooted in loss. And uh, I grew up in the church. I grew up uh, with, uh, you know, Gandalf with a bad attitude, God. And, uh, and it took me a lot of time. It took me 50 years to actually become a child. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then I was able to take 50 years of history and give a gift for Christmas to my kids. How many times have we actually made changes that are beneficial in our lives when things were just going great? You know, we need to be challenged about how we think. And a lot of times, People's responses are based in they're afraid. And I know that because I lived in that world and I'm, that's my people, right? Mm -hmm. So when a person's upset, they're not coming to tell me about me. I already know about me. They're coming to tell me in the only language they know how about what matters to them. And if I'm not at risk, I can step inside that space. Maybe touch nose to nose, maybe ask a good question, maybe stay silent, but respectful because it is about the dignity of the other and the journey that the other is in and finding a way to celebrate that. So consider this, the next time someone misinterprets your good intention, the problem may have more to do with them than actually you. That is the final word for this edition of Studio 5. Until next time, reach out and touch me at Ephraim Graham on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat. And then come on back and see where Studio 5 takes you next week. Bye-bye.